I actually had less than a thousand miles on my baby. A fella in a white car just hit it. The young man's name wasn't actually on the insurance policy. Son, do you know Jesus? So I was sitting at the coffee shop. I hadn't even gotten my Bibles onto the table or ordered my coffee yet. A fella hurriedly came across the room to my table and asked, is that your sports car out there? I, I said, yes, it was. He said, a fella in a white car just hit it. Uh, that was not at all what I was expecting to hear. I actually had less than a thousand miles on my baby and I felt like crying. I was wishing I hadn't heard his alert, but reality is tough to ignore. I quickly bandaged up my broken heart. I tucked in my anger and I calmly walked out to the scene of the crime. There was a lovely white Dodge Challenger parked next to my dream car. A young man with longish hair, plenty of tattoos, and a crying baby climbed out of his car and he handed me his insurance card. He was visibly more shaken than I was. He explained that his baby had been fussing, he got distracted, and it was an accident. I took a photo of his license, of his insurance card, and the wrecked side of my car. I then asked him one question. <clears throat> Son, do you know Jesus? He said he did. And then he said, and I'm fixing to know him better. <laughs> I told him, yes, yes you are. I then told him that I, I understand. I know that things can happen. <clears throat> I also told him the end of the world is coming, but hitting my sports car wasn't it. He mentioned that he was driving his wife's car and he felt awful about everything. I told him that I was glad he hadn't just driven off like some folks might have done. I respected that he had stood right there quite ashamed, but unwavering, and he was ready to take his medicine. <clears throat> I uh, walked up to the front of his car and I was gonna take a picture of his damage and, and I took a picture of it and he said, really his car was fine. Uh, he said the damage on the front of his car was from an earlier accident. And sure enough, unlike my baby's messed up white scratches and ugly white scuffs and white scrapes, his front bumper did seem to only have a wound from an earlier injury. It wasn't my shimmering, glistening, black metallic paint on his white car. The whole thing made me sad. My car was perfect a few minutes earlier. I mean, I, I didn't have a thousand miles on it. It was perfect. And then it wasn't. There's probably a sermon in there somewhere because, uh, I don't know, I guess we all start off that way and then we sin and we ain't either. But uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a sermon. I'm telling you without exaggeration what happened because I got to get this off my chest because it happened and it hurt. Now I got to tell you that uh, I was uncertain what to do or even what to feel. I, I will tell you that before I got to that coffee shop, I had prayed and I asked God, where, where, where do you want me? You know, where, where am I supposed to be right now? And, uh, and that's where I guess he wanted me. But I didn't know 
what to do. I didn't know what to feel. I, I called his insurance agent. He requested a photograph of the damage. I sent him, I sent him the picture. That fellow ought to read my cup. And then the insurance agent was having a hard time <clears throat> finding the information. And he says to me, the young man's name wasn't actually on the insurance policy. And it suddenly became clear. <laughs> it really was his wife's car. And his wife was on her parents' insurance. <laughs> It also became clear that there was about to be some new unexpected complications. <clears throat> I, I, uh, I decided to get back to my studies. It seemed like the smart move at the moment, but I realized after a few minutes that I was really distracted. So I went back out to take another look at my wounded work of art, and I began wondering if the damage could be mitigated by a gent who had done other work on some of our vehicles over the years. You know, I know a guy. <laughs> I also began reflecting on all the problems my wife had been having recently, getting new insurance. You've probably had some of those same problems. Our policies were expiring. She was having a terrible time even getting new quotes. Some carriers were no longer offering insurance in our area. Rates were skyrocketing. And then I thought about that young man with his crying baby. Well, my next call was back to his insurance agent. I mentioned that if he, the young man, or his in-laws wanted to try and resolve this without an insurance claim being made, I, I told him I would, I would try to cooperate. I assumed a claim on such a matter could maybe get him canceled or explode his in-laws rates. The agent said that he really appreciated that. He said he would reach out to the in-laws and delay filing the claim. I agreed to hold off and wait for their comments. Well, suddenly I, I look up and the young man was standing over my Bible at my table holding his baby. He said that his in-laws we're canceling the insurance policy. Don't file a claim. <laughs> he said his wife and his in-laws told him he was not covered on her car. I'm laughing. This is just so funny. <laughs> not funny, not funny, not funny. So he says to me he had coverage, but it was on his motorcycle. He, uh, he drives a big Harley and he works for Harley Davidson. He assumed that since his insurance was on his bike, but he'd been driving her car when he hit my car, the report would go on their car insurance. Now, he apologized and, and he was fumbling around trying to find his motorcycle insurance. He, he couldn't find it and then he was trying to get it found on his, uh, on his phone and he couldn't get his phone to work and the kid was crying and then a baby well he just dumped a major load in his diaper <laughs> not funny not funny not funny not funny but i mean that's kind of funny the young man said he lived a few minutes away and he asked if he could just go get the copy of his harley insurance from his house I agreed and went back to my studies and hoped he would come back. <laughs> About 10 minutes later, he showed up with the card and the crying baby. Clean diaper. He said he really wished his wife was home, but she wasn't available. So I asked him about his wife. He said, well, they weren't really married. It was common law. I asked him, do you love your wife? He said he did. I said, marry her. He, he said he didn't want to make a mistake. He, he wanted to wait till he had more money. And then he wanted to do it right and give her a nice wedding. I mentioned he could get married and have a wedding, 
whenever that became affordable. He understood. But he said he was afraid to make a mistake. I reminded him he'd already made a mistake. I, I asked him if he was taking care of his wife and his baby. And he said that he was. I told him that was admirable. Taking care of his family was exactly what a responsible man should do. And then he kept looking at his phone and he mentioned, he says, my in-laws are blowing up the phone. <laughs> they didn't want that accident on their insurance. They're canceling the insurance. His wife was freaking out. He knew he had hit a very expensive car. I told him we'd find a way to work it out. <laughs> he looked at the baby and he said, well, you're never going to go to college. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. And he was serious. The kid just wiggled, waggled, and kept howling. This was a crying baby. I asked him if he remembered the main question that I'd proposed when I first spoke to him at the accident site. And he said that he did. I repeated the question to make sure we were on the same page. Do you know Jesus? And once again, he said that he did. I asked him if that was true, how could he ignore what the Bible says about his behavior? Marry the girl. And he repeated that he was afraid. He then told me that his mother had seven children, all with different husbands. He said he hadn't talked to her since he was uh, a, a very young. I assured him that he needed to forgive his mother. It was mandatory. He said he'd left home very, very young, joined the army at 18. He stayed in for four and a half years. I asked him when he got out, he said about a year ago, and he'd been with his wife, you know, ever since. I then told him again, he needed to forgive his mother. I reminded him that he was healthy he had successfully served his duty in the military. He had much for which to be thankful, not the least of which was in spite of all the mistakes his mother had made, she didn't abort him. I, I tried to make him understand that his mother was probably living with a lot of misery and piles of regret. It was wrong and ungodly for him to hold it all against her. He should release her because he had no real choice but to forgive her if he knows Jesus. I told him if he wants to have salvation in Christ and enjoy the forgiveness Jesus offers him, his mother must be forgiven for him to move on with the Lord. And even though he didn't know his father, he needed to forgive him too. Then I asked him why he wouldn't share his name with his wife. He said that was what she'd always been asking him. And I asked him why he wouldn't share his name with their baby. I pointed out that he should consider what other people might choose to call his child because of that decision. He then told me the most surprising thing. He said that the baby was not his child. It was actually his wife's sister's baby. They were raising the baby and trying to adopt him. I told him how beautiful that gesture was. It was a good and a godly decision. He then explained that after he'd left home, someone took him in, adopted him, and raised him. And it was apparent that he felt this was his opportunity to help another little boy that needed help. I suggested he needed to ask the Lord how to make more good decisions. And I assured him that God would help him. I asked him if he ever hoped to afford a wedding. 
how he thought he might do that if he didn't have the blessings of God in his life. He needed to walk in the blessings of God if he wanted things to go well. He had to make a simple choice. And I told him, very clear, did he want God's blessings or did he want God's curses? Both were available to him. Which did he want? And I explained that this stuff was really quite simple. Not easy, but very simple. Nothing complex about any of the decisions he needed to make. Choose right or choose wrong. I pointed to my open Bible and said that if he had any belief in that book, the choices were limited to right or wrong. Again, not easy, but very simple. Nothing complex to discuss. It became apparent that he was listening to every word being spoken, every question asked, and every legitimate concern being raised. And then he said, nobody ever talked to him like this. Nobody ever told him that straight put him up before. <laughs> I laughed pretty hard and told him to forgive the bad pun, but I was glad we had bumped into each other. I did not bump into him. He bumped into me. And he didn't just bump. <laughs> I didn't say that part. I'm telling you that part because that's what I was thinking. But then I doubled down on my dad jokes and I said it was no accident that we had met because I knew exactly why I was at that coffee shop at that time. Thank you, God, in all things. Give thanks. Rejoice in tribulation. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The testing of your faith is precious. It's more valuable than gold and more valuable than sports cars. I asked him if he goes to church. He said he went to a church far on the other side, the Metroplex. I asked him if he was in relationship with any of the pastors or staff of the church, and he said he wasn't, and it was a very big church. I said, so in other words, that just means you don't often go to church, and when you do, it's easy just to show up and hide out. He hung his head and admitted that that was all that it was. I made clear to him he should be in a church. I asked him if I could invite him to a small local church where people would love him. He enthusiastically agreed. I told him, I know the pastor, and I think he might even marry them when he's ready. I also told him the pastor had adopted a little baby boy too, and that would be one of my grandsons. I asked him if I could pray for him and for his baby. And he was very enthusiastic and grateful. And we stood up right there in the coffee shop at that table and prayed in the mighty name of Jesus. We boldly invited the Holy Spirit to show him the truths that he needed to understand and to empower him to do the right things, to bless him, to bless his wife, and to bless little Josiah. His baby. Well, that coffee shop was closing. I packed up and left to find another table somewhere else with good light and fresh Java because I needed to write this stuff down. I did not want to forget the events of that memorable day. And I knew I'd have to explain it all to my wife when I got home. And I also realized I would still need to do something about my car. The end of the world is coming. But this ain't it. I'm glad I know Jesus. By the way, while I was writing this account down at another coffee shop, a couple of young women sat down at a nearby table. <laughs> One was on her phone, the other was busy typing on her computer. When I completed my little note-taking assignment for myself, I got up and walked toward the door. 
The pretty young lady on her computer looked up and called out to me. She said, sir, is that, is that your car in front of the shop? I said, it was. She said, it's a very beautiful car. I was happy to hear that. It's still could be seen as a beautiful car from one side. <laughs> Ain't funny, not funny, not funny, not funny. <laughs> it's not sort of funny. And she, she looks at me and she says, Sir, may I ask you what you do for a living? I said, well, I was in the food business and I do some work in commercial real estate. And she said, Oh, so you are an entrepreneur. I said, no, oh, I, I guess I am. And I asked her, I said, what, what do you do? And she replied, I'm a college student. What advice would you give me? I thought about it for a second and I said, young lady, do you know Jesus? She was happy to say that she did. I told her, you ask the Lord what he would have you do. You live for him faithfully. He will direct you. And young lady, he will bless you. And I left. And when I got out to my beautiful car, I grabbed one of my books and I went back into the coffee shop. I handed her a copy of the book and I told her, I said, I also write some books. As I was leaving the parking space, she came running out to my car and she insisted I autograph it for her, which I did. Well, as I drove off, I put the top down. It was beautiful weather, and I gave thanks to God for another fascinating day to live for Him. Ain't God good? I'm thinking I need to call that young man and offer him a trade. Maybe I'll tell him if he pays for a marriage license, I'll cover the repair costs. After all, it's just a car, and I know a guy. <laughs> I'm glad I know Jesus. Till next time, shalom.